What is going on there, citizens of the Reject Nation? We are going to watch today The Last of Us, Episode 6, Easter Eggs Breakdown from the man himself. Pull heavy spoilers. Joined, of course, by my friend Andrew Gordon. Hello there, Eagle 7-Eleven. Hello. Uh, I've never actually met Paul, but every time I hear you do that impression, I actually think it's him. So keep it up, dude. That's I'll impressive. I think I'm nailing it. Why don't you go ahead and leave a lock? Sweep your chimney, all wheel, all wheel. Have a spot of tea, but check out our reaction for episode six today. All righty. Groovy, baby. Yeah. <laughs> I, I understood go. that reference. Let's go. <laughs> Welcome to the Heavy Spoilers Show. I'm your host, Paul, and this video we're breaking down episode six of The Last of Us. Yes. The latest entry is packed with Easter eggs, tons of callbacks to the game, and also a big cliffhanger ending that we're going to be explaining the outcome of in this video. We'll save that until the end as always, as it has some major game spoilers in it, I'll of course give you a heads up before we hit that section as always. I'm excited. However, for this episode, they do hit a part that didn't actually get fleshed out properly until the second game. I'm not going to be giving away any massive spoilers in terms of the story, but I think it's important to talk about how it at least looks similar to that. So if you don't so want things important. like the bar we see in this is the bar in the second game, and I'm sorry for, for spoiling it there, <sighs> and I hope you join us again next week. See you, chump. Now, the entry has a major reunion with Tommy and Jackson, and though this happens in the first game, they actually have the reunion in the town that appears in the second. When you arrive so there in cool. part one, you were primarily at a dam, which the people of Jackson were repairing to power the town. We see this location in the episode, but we don't get the shootout that happens there in the game. I do wish we did get the dam brought to life because I love the aesthetic. And we haven't done anything bringing from the game where you have Ellie in water and then you, you put her on some like pallet, pa a pallet. Yeah, because in the game, she's often, oh, I can't swim. So Joel has to uncomfortably swim, but dries off incredibly fast. I knew there was something missing in this show and it was a pallet. It was a that pallet. was it. That's, but... that's what everyone's clamoring for. The <laughs> but I, I agree. It would have been cool to see the dam brought to life, but at least we did get to see an exterior shot, which I appreciate, but I actually did just play that level in the game and it's so much fun. I love that part. You didn't venture into Jackson and it was only in part two that you saw the town for what it was, which is perfectly recaptured here. Now in the game, this section actually takes place in the fall and thus there's none of the snow that we see in this entry. However, part two starts off in the winter with the town covered in a vast blanket of it and you even have a snowball fight early on to learn the mechanics of the game. Snowball this fight. is referenced later on in the episode when we get the tour of the town and we can see some kids playing in the background. Yeah. I think they bump the timeline of the show up to recapture the look of Snowy Jackson and there's several landmarks there that we'll talk about later on in the video. Also, it's important to bear in mind that in the game, the community hadn't really been set up yet, which is why you were creating a power source through repairing the dam. Now we pick up with a flashback to last week in which Henry took his own life after shooting Sam. In the game, you immediately cut to black after that, and I think they went back to this in the intro to mirror it in the show. It's all your fault! Henry! Henry, no! <laughs> We didn't point this out last time on the on the show, but when Henry does, what does the YouTube say for it? Unalive himself. I did like it more in that episode because we got to like see Ellie's reaction and really focus on that. And I actually thought it made it more impactful to breathe in that moment and see the burial. Just a little side side bit right there. <laughs> but that does mirror the game. We get an immediate time jump, and The Last of Us did this after several deaths, most notably Sarah's. On the HBO podcast for the show, they said that they added in the burial scene to show how much Joel had now become a parent. Joel wasn't the kind he of person that, that would stick around and bury the dead, but he did this for Ellie so that she could grieve and grow. There was uh, talk about how yes, kids have it easy yes. because no one's relying on them, but Ellie had Sam very much relying on her. Neil Druckmann said that Joel remained at the grave because he realized he couldn't go through this again, and after watching another kid die like Sarah, he struggled with getting attached to Ellie. Now we also see some dead rabbits being taken in, and the winter chapter of the game started off with one hopping along before it was then shot by an arrow with Ellie. That's the cutest oh, I've seen this clip. <laughs> Funny clip. <laughs> Poor girl. This is someone who's returning home <laughs> to his wife, my reaction. and we know from the cast list that the character is called Marlin. Played by Graham Greene, this is actually a new character for the show along with his wife Florence. He discovers that Joel has her at gunpoint and they've been living out in the wilderness together. 
The whole setup here seems pretty alien to what you'd come across in the game, and I think they've done this to sort of mirror Bill and Frank. We have an elderly couple that have managed to stay together through the apocalypse and carve out what's likely been a relatively peaceful life. You know what I like about having that tidbit in there? Because as you know, a, a world that has experienced the pandemic recently, there were a lot of us who were like, ah, dream come true. Never have to leave and keep away from everyone else. So I actually feel like including that with Bill and then this couple here actually makes it feel a little bit more relatable. Yeah, no, I actually did like that inclusion. It was a good expansion. And just also, too, I like that interaction that they had with Joel and Ellie as well. And I like those uh, thatting that they had with those two characters. What I got from that is you liked it. I like the script. <laughs> That's what I got from all that. The scene is played for laughs, and we quickly realize that Joel and Ellie are terrible at interrogating. Now, this is actually riffing on a scene from yes! a game that uses the same tactics, <laughs> but it's way more bloody in the source material. Oh, yeah. Joel says, We're somewhere here. Exactly where? And your answer better be the same as your wife's. He's torturing him. You wait <laughs> yeah. here. I love this. Where? Scene. In the town. In the town. But you're going to mark it on the map. And it better be the same exact spot your buddy points to. I really love that scene in the game. We're definitely going to work in this scene, <laughs> but perhaps a future event for when that scene comes up. Having a moment like that, I think, is really important for Joel because I think it even demonstrates more of just how far he's willing to go in the name of love, the way how Craig Mazin has talked about with this series. Because, yeah. yeah, he gets like very, as you saw in that clip, very violently, emotionally aggressive. Yeah, and just to clarify, when I said expansion, that's what I meant on the interrogation because this was a different form of interrogation when they had another scene with the at the actor from Dance with the Wolves. And also, fun tidbit, I wonder if they do have this scene in the show. Wouldn't it be interesting if that is played by Troy Baker like in the, uh, Ooh, in the show? Ooh, that'd be cool. <laughs> be like, what the hell? Yeah, I'd love that. <laughs> and Marlin also has a bow and arrow, and this is a weapon that you use throughout the game to stay stealthy. He brings up Cody, and this is the location that Joel thought Tommy was located at earlier in the season. However, we learn oh, that yes, he's teaming yes. with Infected, and thus it makes sense why they moved from there. Joel has been desperately searching for his brother since then, and this is why he's had to resort to holding up two lovely, lovely people in a cabin who <laughs> always probably hit the thumbs up button. Now with them comes an ominous warning not to cross the river. But you never go past the river here. What's past the river? Death. Now in Jackson, they play up that they use his reputation to keep out stragglers, but I actually think they might be teasing some people from the game that oh, we'll definitely. talk about in the super spoiler section, section, section. Definitely. Anyway, they haven't heard of the Fireflies, <coughs> and outside, Joel has to take a rest. We don't really learn what this is, but the last couple of months have been hell on him, and this comes full circle at the end of the episode. This is a new addition for the series, and Joel didn't deal with any of the health problems that we see him getting here. He did, however, get stabbed like what happens in the end, though this yeah. was on some rebar instead of the hunter's weapons. Anyway, they head out after taking one of her rabbits, and this is slung up on Ellie's backpack, rising the, the game, rabbits. she ties it to her horse. They set out across the landscape, and I love shots like this where you actually get to see the beauty of it. Reminds you of just how long this journey is and how far they have to travel. They go from cities to forests and mountain ranges, and the game did this too, with it constantly feeling like you were never in the same place for too long. True. Now, Great they mistakenly cardio, man. think that they've reached the river of death and decide to bunker down for the night. We see Joel applying duct tape to his boot, and this is something that he of course did to Tess in episode 2. Now, though this scene doesn't appear in the game, it was actually originally meant to, and this moment is based on concept Oh, no that way! Part one. Didn't know that. That's in like it, Star Wars Joel, shit. sat around the campfire and shared stories like what we see here. When discussing it, Neil Druckmann said, That was a moment we couldn't make work in the game. So that was a conversation I had with Craig on how do we capture these downbeat moments. Thanks for coming on the show there, Neil. I actually hope they do that a, a lot more. I never even suspected that the game had a deleted scene because it's a video game. My mind never ventures like, it's a video game. They can include whatever the hell they want. And after playing Last of Us 2, it looks like they included whatever the hell they want because the game's like 50 hours long. That's like a almost akin to kind of like what Mandalorian does when they bring in deleted scenes or concept art and actually bring it to... Uh, I've uh, played the first game many times and I've done a lot of research and I never even knew that that was a possible deleted scene or they had concept art for it. So that was a really cool tidbit, Paul. And congrats on getting Neil Druckmann on your channel. It was awesome. Now the pair's dishes return from the camping scene in episode four and they share a drink with Ellie doing the usual face you'd pull anytime you had some alcohol Still when gross. you were 14, which I, I never did anything like that. 
Mm-hmm. Natalie starts to think about the future, and she talks about what they're going to do after the cure is made. But she does have a line in there. Maybe it's in his super spoiler section, and he doesn't want to say it. I hope it is. I'm going to bring it up later, though. Because Greg pointed that out immediately uh, as it happened. Come on, Paul. You got to be better, man. You didn't even tease that it's going to be in the super spoilery section. We're judging you if you don't put that in there. That could be a line, possibly, in that possible thing you're talking about. Just saying. People are like, what the hell is Chris talking about? <laughs> like, probably like, what are we both talking about? <laughs> I don't even know what we're talking about. The pair have been so focused on getting to the Fireflies that they haven't thought beyond it, but yeah, they really start to look towards the future. Joel says he wants an old farmhouse where he'll raise sheep, and this actually has some <laughs> other tiny part too, along with what Ellie says. We won't spoil it until the end of the video again, and it's... Say it with me, super spoiler section. Super spoiler talking section? talking about astronauts in space will likely have a payoff too. Anyway, Ellie Definitely. confesses that she rubbed her blood onto Sam to see if it would save him, and it clearly has her doubting whether she's actually the savior. I tried Joel it the other day, it doesn't work. <laughs> his watch and, rubs it, and we've talked about this in our prior breakdowns. He does this whenever he thinks about Sarah, and it happened before they just reached the Boston State Building. I would love to see an interview with Pedro Pascal and ask, like, when you weren't actually filming or just in your trailer did you always have that watch you know their actors often do some type of like proper physical motifs to help them stay in character or stay in the mood oh if he had a hard time channeling joel he would like look at the watch and then you know activate a memory something like that i, w- I wonder if that's already out there because that sounds like a, it would be really cool to if he actually did the uh, like joaquin phoenix for johnny cash would always carry the guitar around with him because he felt like it was an extension of his character and i wonder if that was something that pedro pascal also did citizens of the reject nation we are asking you to message Pedro Pascal and to get him on an interview with the real rejects. That would be cool. I would love that. Like, let's talk about Mandalorian instead. <laughs> no, let's talk about Wonder Woman 1984. Let's go, let's go to the Law and Order episodes. You were wrong. He glanced down at his watch, and this is something that was then carried over to the show. When he was watching Henry and Ellie play football, he also did it then, and I love how this motif keeps reappearing throughout the series. Obviously, the watch doesn't work, and it's more of a reminder of the life he lost. However, it's also shown that Ellie could be a second chance for him to be a dad, and he switches in this moment to be nicer towards her. He reassures her that Marlene knows what she's Uh. doing, and we can clearly see a major change in Joel. It's also important to bear in mind that they don't mind starting a fire here, whereas in episode 4, they of course avoided doing it. Hunters wouldn't really be out this far, as they tended to stick near the cities, and the infected also froze when they were in these conditions. In part two, you come across some frozen stiff, and they very much tend to stick to warmer areas. Yeah. Joel has slept in, and Ellie's taken the second shift, showing how much more independent she's becoming. She carries his rifle, and in the game of the hotel, Joel ended up giving this to her so she could provide sniper cover as he took out hunters. The podcast for the series talked about the scene in which he gave her the gun in episode four, and this was very much a moment of Joel becoming a father once more. Like any parent, he's given a child a skill that they feel they can now do on their own, and this Ellie's taken it upon herself to stand God with the gun. Give kids guns. It's also important to bear in mind that Joel's deafness is clearly putting them in a vulnerable position. In episode one, he didn't hear Tess coming in when he was asleep. We had the whole thing with Henry and Sam, and now he's not even hearing Ellie getting up. You can see Stoner down himself, and at the end, he doesn't hear the hunter sneaking up on them. They make their way across a bridge, and once more we assume that this is the River of Death. I think we will see something like this in Episode 7, and finally get that sweet, sweet River of Death. Let's pray. (laughs) Metal Gear Solid 3. That was not Metal Gear Solid 3. What was that? Was that? I think that's Metal Gear Solid 3. Is it Snake? Or isn't that Metal Gear? Oh, yeah. Anyway, what does it matter? Are there any characters in the game who are deaf? Not that I remember. Because that has been a prevalent inclusion in here with Sam... And now with Joel, like the sense of sound is so integral to the experience of the video game itself because you you do have to always abide by the rules of sound in that game that it is interesting to have um, characters that we focus on struggle with their own hearing and how detrimental that can be to survival in this world. I like to really quickly that they added that for Joel just because... In the game, he really feels invincible, like super. <laughs> yeah. So you know, giving him a deficiency like that too, it kind of it makes him more feel more vulnerable, True. Feel more you know, it humanizes him a little more. So I think it was a good add-on. I think this was Metal Gear Solid Three. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'm glad we straightened that out because with the whole comment section would have been littered with that was the wrong game you guys mentioned. And we also get a play on the scene from the game when Ellie tries to whistle. <laughs> I'm learning how to whistle. You don't know how to whistle? Neither do I, Ellie. I know how to whistle. Really? I really don't. 
Are you all right? I'm trying to learn how to whistle. Hey, it's something for you to annoy me with. You don't know how to whistle. Well, does it sound like I know how to whistle? <laughs> they then come across the aforementioned Hydro Dam, which was a location you had to navigate to get past. Ellie couldn't swim, and you had to jump in the water and use a board to navigate her so she could build a bridge for you. On the other side of this, he came across a child's grave, and this was potentially played upon last week. Ah, uh, yes. Says that Ellie's no Livingston, thinking, yeah. and this was the guy who wrote the amazing five-star reviewed pun book. And after guessing wrongly that this is the river of death again, <clears throat> I'm starting to think Ellie should start saying through time <laughs> for the amount of <laughs> she talks. Anyway, they're ambushed by people on horseback with their guns drawn. Dogs are brought in to smell if they're infected, and in Jackson, you actually got to pet one when you were going through the dam. That's Buckley. Not much of a guard dog. No good to have around. <laughs> That's a good boy. Now, in facing off a group of enemies, a lot of them would also carry dogs, and they'd sniff you out as you moved about areas. Yeah, kill Jackson a lot of dogs. is its yeah. own settlement away a from lot. Fedra, and thus it doesn't have the government technology like the scanners we saw in episode one. So they have to use dogs to smell cordyceps, but it doesn't flag up on Ellie, probably because it's been nullified or it's mutated in her. Now here we meet Maria for the first time, who we learn is Tommy's wife. She gets a far more fleshed out role here, and in the first game, you just had a couple of words with her here and there when you arrived at the dam. And she's white in the game, but black in the show. Is everyone too scared to point it out? <laughs> not Greg. No, I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> The shark she adds an extra dimension to their relationship and they make her pregnant, which is something that wasn't in the game at all. Now they hit the front gate and these are modeled to look exactly the same as how they appear at the start of part two. In that you I didn't in catch on to that at first. Which is of I did. course also how they get in here. As they enter the town, we see two signs and the first of these is the Lights Festival. This was advertised for 2003, which again is a reminder of when the world collapsed in the show. Jackson was lit up with lights for part two, and this came off the back of the hydro dam that you helped to power up in part one. We later on see these being used as lights through the town at night, and this signs a nice bit of foreshadowing to set that whole thing up. Now to the right, we can also see the tipsy bison. The tipsy bison. This was a location that too appeared in part two, and this is very much just the creative team laying the groundwork for what's coming. Yeah. We'll talk about what happens there in the spoiler section, but I did warn you there'd be things like, the, the bar is the same as the other bar. Now, you ruined the second game! As she writes in. The first is a woman in a wheelchair, and the second is a bunch of kids at school. In the game, the reason that Henry and Sam fled Hartford is because once Fedra abandoned their posts, they often fell into the hands of raiders who refused to care for kids or the elderly. Here, though, we see the Jacksonites will look after the weak and infirm, and it shows what kind of civilization that they're trying to build. As we mentioned in the game, That's they hadn't point. got it set good up point. yet, and Joel, bloody Joel, he was actually the more optimistic one, thinking they could make a new world. You still got to deal with infected though, right? Who doesn't? The world maybe you don't have to. Or maybe you don't have to be. Now Joel sees Tommy working on some scaffolding, and this changes things up from how it happens in the game. Don't even think about reaching for your weapon. Tell the girl to drop hers now. Ellie, do as the lady says. Tommy! We didn't know the place was occupied. We're just trying to make our way through. Through to where? They're all right. But you know these people? Know him. He's my goddamn brother. Tommy. I wish they spoke Spanish in the show. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. Hermano. <laughs> How you doing, baby brother? We kind of combine the guns being drawn and Tommy being amongst them, whereas in the show we get the riders and then them taking them in. As I keep mentioning, this happened at the dam because Jackson wasn't a location they'd made for the game. And damn, it's gonna get annoying when I keep pointing that out. But on we go. We've been here just a week and it feels like forever. Yeah, it makes sense to me that the reunion would feel entirely different uh, between them, especially because in, in the game itself, you know, they, they're, they've grown distant, and uh, it seems like they ended on not a good note, where here in the show, they're still in contact, and he's like, I haven't been able to hear from my brother. I keep in contact with him regularly. No text messages, no FaceTime calls, none of it's working right now. So it makes sense that their reunion would be a lot more heartfelt and emotional versus, like, as you saw here, there's, like, as much as he still missed, they still missed each other, you still feel like gap between them 
Right. I mean, as you just pointed out, there was difference of reasons. Like, whereas in the game, you know, they had a falling out, whereas here, he hadn't heard from him in a while, so it makes sense, you know, why you have that difference. And I like what they did here, uh, having the riders, and then we get the reveal of Maria, and I really like that actress a lot from True Blood uh, that plays her, and I, I like how they fleshed out Maria a lot more in this, and they made her pregnant, so it adds a lot more stakes for Tommy's character, too. Obviously, we don't want anything to happen to Tommy, but the fact that he's got a kid on the way just adds more tension and stakes for his character. True, true. Notice he didn't mention she was black. Now, the official HBO podcast brought up that Joel very much has it within him that he needs to protect his family. And going back to the conversation in the truck, there were hints towards this. Joel talked about how he only followed Tommy because he wanted to keep him alive. I think this is very much the same in the case of Ellie, and he's the kind of person who needs to be a protective father figure. This is due to Sarah's core death, belief. Which shaped his personality, and he now thinks that he has to protect his family no matter the cost. Now they end up hugging, which appears in both the show and game, and Joel says he's came here to save him. He is, of course, starting to believe in the vaccine, and as far as they're concerned, they're on a quest to save the world. Now, like what happens in the game, they're offered food by Maria. Why don't we bring him inside? Yeah. You hungry? Starving. Wow. We get a chow down and a proper meal, there. and we get what I think is a cameo from a character that pops up in part two. We'll discuss her later on, ah. but she's clearly seen what's going on with Ellie, who doesn't act like the rest of the kids in Jackson. 100% Tommy a cameo. Maria <laughs> announced they're married, and it kind of calls back to this moment from the game. Maria is family, actually. Oh, shit. Congrats. <laughs> Ma'am, thanks for not blowing my head off. Would have been embarrassing, considering you're my brother-in-law. We all got to get wrangled up at some point. Now they get a tour that m more foreshadowing for season two, and we see sheep tying back to the farm that Joel talked about around the campfire. It seems like the perfect home for them, and Ellie meets the horse Shimmer, which is also the name of the horse that she rides in the game. Shimmer! What? Come on, that's not really spoiling stuff. She has a horse. Anyway, I love the realization of Tommy realizing that they're pretty much communist. He, of course, had this view of the world, but in order to survive, he's had to alter his principles to fit it. Also, before you start calling the authority for British values or whatever, I'm not a communist. I think it's interesting how he's had to adapt to a different way of life to survive. I'm guessing that they're trying to say that Fedra and the Raiders are capitalists as they're all out for themselves and trying to exploit people, but... We're getting a bit deep on that, the political theories there. Anyway, they hit the tipsy bison, and Tommy this has show's to crack the ice because the machine probably uses too much power. This whole place is covered in snow as well, so they can just grab it from there. It's a bit of an icy reception, and I see it's clearly uneasy between the pair. And we get some stuff that pulls from the game. It doesn't seem like you age much. You, on the other hand. Let me look at you. <clears throat> You're fucking old. Easy. It's going to happen to you, too. Yeah. And the kid? Oh, yeah. She's the daughter of some firefly muckety muck. You're almost being important. What is the deal with this? You, some big wig's daughter or something? So you know where they might be, these fireflies? Why bring her here? I was supposed to deliver to the fireflies. The way I figure they're your boys. <laughs> You finish the job, you collect the whole damn payment. I haven't seen a firefly in years. You know, they got a base down at the University of Eastern Colorado. It's uh, a week's ride south. What makes you think I'd do this for you? This isn't for me, Tommy. This is for your damn cause. My cause is my family now. You ain't talking about some walk in the park here. Jesus, boy. Have Maria get some of your born-again friends to do it. They got families, too. Maria's a few months along now. So I just gotta be more careful. Now we've often talked about how Joel pushes things to the back of his mind so he doesn't have to face the truth or inflict pain on others. In the game, he refused to tell Bill that Tessa died and even kept up the lie that she was back in Boston. So what kind of trouble are you in? Where the hell's Tess? It's just a job, S simple drop off. I didn't mean to take care of that, relax. So you didn't answer my question about Tess. Yeah, I thought the two of you were inseparable. She's busy. Sounds like there's trouble in paradise. Busy. Sounds <laughs> like there might be trouble in paradise. Oh, yeah, gosh. something like that. Nicely. He done. does the same thing here and pretends that everything's all good with her. So how's Tess? 
She's fine. I think he does this because talking about her death means that he has to acknowledge it happened, and with this brings the pain of their loss and also the feeling that he's failed. At the dam in the game, rather than talking about Tess, Tommy brought up Sarah. He said he'd actually gone back to where they lived in Texas to visit yep. their old home. He picked up a photo they didn't of Joel show and this. Sarah, but Joel didn't even really want to look at it, and he dismissed it pretty quickly. Here. <clears throat> it's a little faded, but it still looks pretty good. I'm good. You sure? I mean, I said I'm good. Again, this is the character completely broken, but refusing to accept it because he doesn't want to deal with the pain that comes with loss. He lies and says that he was heading this way and just so happened to pass by Jackson. Well, we know that he's been searching with Tommy for months and months and months. Yeah, I love that the show actually takes the time to really unpack that significantly more. If there's one thing this show can do and, and take the opportunity to, while sometimes they skip over some awesome gameplay moments, I think they really double down on more of the emotional beats and the character exploration. And it's something that makes Joel, who's, you know, he's, he's an archetype, Joel. In, in the game, he's an archetype. And he's great, though. He's amazing. Don't get me wrong. Like, I love the hell out of Joel, one of my favorite video game characters ever. But here, they make him far more than just the archetype of guy with a hardened past who now refuses to accept his emotions. He's he's someone who fights against breaking down, but is on the verge of it constantly. Yeah, I agree. And also, I like that Paul just showed that scene that we didn't get uh, in terms of him showing uh, the picture, Tommy rather, showing Joel the picture True. of Sarah, which I think is going to circle back to a scene that I won't mention. When we get to the spoiler section here, I'll, I'm going to bring that back. Don't worry, I won't forget about that. Good, good. So I got to bring up something. You got to bring up something. Guys, we, we are going to bring up so many something. Plan all along was to get Ellie here, but we see in the end that he accepts she's his responsibility. Now, we really see the difference between Tommy and John at this point when they discuss what they had to do to survive. They're very protective of this place. You have a good fucking reason. I mean, folks find out we're up here. No, I heard. Wrong people might show up. So is that what I am? Am I the wrong people? This is how you going to repay me, huh? Repay you? For all those goddamn years I took care of us. Those I'm things I did, Tommy, those things that you judged me for. I did those things to keep us alive. We did those things. Took care. That's what you call it? I got nothing but nightmares from those years. You survived because of me. It wasn't worth it. They weren't things. We murdered people. I bring you the cure from mankind, and you want to play the pissy little brother. And I don't judge you for it. We survived the only way we knew how. But there were other ways. We ain't back in Boston. You lay your hands on me again, it won't end well for you. We'll grab some supplies and be out of your hair in the morning. Tommy sees it as murdering people, whereas Joel sees it as being something that he had to do to survive. That's something, again, that I like, I like to acknowledge whenever I find that they replicate scenes, but they feel different based off of the kind of scene work and prelude into it. Because I love the way how Pedro Pascal chose to play those lines of dialogue. Because, you know, Troy Baker's, that version works so well in that moment in the game. He's defensive and angry, whereas Pedro Pascal, when he is saying those lines to him, you get the defensive part, but you get more of the hurt part. Like, yes. you are judging Absolutely. me for this, and you're not appreciating anything for me. And now you're really judging me to my core when... I did this for you as well, you know? So I, I like that he plays more on the pain of that versus the defense mechanism of just anger. Yeah, and also, too, you got a different side version uh, of Tommy in the show as well where he's like, he was being a little more understanding and, I mean, obviously saying, like, yeah, it was terrible what we did, but I don't judge you for it, mm -hmm. you know? So, yeah, I appreciated that they had that moment with uh, Diego, Diego Luna, Gabriel Luna. True. Sure. It's a Latino understanding. <laughs> Joel's selfishness and need to keep things that he wants is something that's a theme which repeats throughout the story, but in all honesty, I think most of us would have done the same thing. People would like to think that the good guys who would make sacrifices if the time called for it, but <laughs> a lot me. of us will happily step on others to keep going. Definitely. Joel to me very much represents the true face of humanity, whereas Tommy wants to be something better. Now this new outlook has likely been brought on by the fact that he's gonna be a father. In their relationship before the outbreak, Joel was the one with the kid, whereas Tommy was the one with no responsibilities. He'd be the one off down the bars starting fights and showing up to his brother's house looking for breakfast. Here though, he's now the father, and the one who is seen as being the father is left without a kid. Sarah was supposed to have so much ahead of her, but this was raw from both her and Joel for this worse world. Tommy says, Just because life stopped for you, doesn't mean it has to stop for me. 
and this is of course reflected in his watch, which stopped the second Sarah was shot. Now outside, things get too much for him again, and he ends up having to rest. Again, all this is new for the show, with it not really appearing in the game. I think when you're playing as the character, you don't really think of health problems and stuff because you're very much them. Yeah. However, Giol is in his 50s, and he's been traveling on the road for months and months with very little rest and food. He's sleeping in on the mornings, having to take his time, and slowly going deaf. Yeah, there is a you're big not physical toll. Young chicken anymore, and this adds a lot to the character. He also sees <laughs> someone that he believes is Sarah, all grown up. I'm sure anyone who's ever lost somebody can relate to this moment, and you, do, you often do see strangers that you think could be the person, even if it's impossible. Joel has a brief moment where he forgets everything's lost, and it's almost like he's seeing Sarah grown up, happy with the life she should have had. It's pretty devastating, and that explains why he wants to hold on to Ellie. Now from here we cut to Ellie, who's holed up in a child's room. The pictures on the wall and colour in general are of course meant to evoke Sarah's from episode 1, and we're slowly seeing the two become more similar and similar. Later on when Joel comes in, we see a giraffe poster on the wall, mimicking the giraffe toy that appeared in Sarah's room in the game. They also walked past one in episode 2, and giraffes are very important, so keep an eye out for uh, them. Giraffes. The room also has a really great poster in, and we can catch Creep by Radiohead. This is a song about being an outsider, not feeling like you belong, and it's very much representative of how Ellie feels. They also hate that in song. Jackson, there were several you know houses that? <laughs> that were obviously owned by people who died on outbreak day that people ended up filling. This is very much the case here, and Ellie gets a note saying, I'm across the street. This is written on homemade paper, which I remember having to do back in primary school in some art and craft lesson. Obviously, Primary they don't have school. Dunder Mifflin in this world, so if they want to make notes like this, they have to either get some paper from 2003 or make their own. We next see Ellie touching a purple and white hoodie, and this is what she wore from the damn pot onwards. Now lastly, it's a cap to deal with her periods, and we of course saw her looking for one in episode 3, which was her risking her life. I'm not no expert on this stuff, but with it being rubber, I'm guessing it's reusable, so she won't have to go into any basements anymore. Now Joel's a man, so he probably doesn't think about these kinds of things, and that's why it's given by Maria. Ellie goes to her house, and this looks similar to the layout of some of the houses that you'd come across when walking around Jackson. Thousand percent. Think in a moment, that's a pretty big gut punch once you realize what it is. On a chalkboard, we see two uh, names with a set of dates below them. This belongs to Kevin and Sarah, and this is very much the pair's gravestone to mark their passing. Now Kevin's a new character for the show, and we see that he died at the age of three, wow. two days after the outbreak. That. We learn Kevin was Maria's child and it shows why she makes a bond with her, whilst also showing why Maria doesn't want Tommy running off. Maria instantly goes into motherly mode and makes sure that she has a coat to keep her warm. She also cuts her hair and if you've ever played the Walking Dead Telltale game, then you'll know you did a similar thing in that with Clementine so that she couldn't get grabbed by the undead. We learn that Maria was a oh, district cool. attorney okay. and this Interesting. explains why she's kind of shifted into being a sheriff. She's clearly accepted the loss of her child, and she's a complete opposite to Joel due to the fact that she's happy to talk about Kevin. It's at this point that Ellie learns about Sarah, and suddenly the penny drops. One thing I love about the podcast is that they've really delved deep into the fact that Ellie's looking for a parental figure just as much as Joel is looking for a surrogate daughter. This is why Ellie smiled when he beat up the soldier in episode 1, and why she said last week that she was scared of being alone. Now the two very much have this father and daughter huh. relationship, but in this world, it leads to them enabling the other to carry out terrible things. This was very apparent in the Brian scene in which Ellie allowed Joel to murder him. Neil Druckmann said that in any other show or movie that she would try and plead for Brian's life because killing him was the, the evil thing to do. However, Ellie knows that Joel has to do it, and thus she just walked away with her back turned. She's clearly defensive of Joel and won't let Maria badmouth him or warn her about what Joel's really like. Now Ellie clearly ends up feeling betrayed by Joel's plan to ditch her and in her mind she built up that he was going to be her dad. We see this reflected in the next scene in which we cut to the people of Jackson watching the movie The Goodbye Girl. That's what now, it is, the okay. The are summing up Never heard of it. happened often in the city and there was one that was going to happen during the super spoiler section which we'll talk about later. Anyway, the movie actually has a lot of allusions to what's going on in the story right now. It involves a single mother moving into an apartment with her daughter and her actor boyfriend Tony. He gets a job in Italy and he ends up subletting the apartment to a man named Elliot who's played by Richard Dreyfus. The mother Paula and he start a relationship and over time the daughter Lucy becomes attached to Elliot. However, he gets a job in Seattle and Lucy worries the same thing is going to happen with him that happened to Tony. 
This is, of course, reflected in Elliot, the movie. who believes that Joel's <laughs> ditching her like all the other people in her life. So far, she's had several parental figures, including Fedra, <laughs> Marlene, Tess, and Joel, and the bar the last one, they've all been people she's left behind. I understood that reference. I understood it too, because of the game. It's called Left Behind, I get it. Or are you talking about the Bible movies? Both. Yes, my Jewish friend. He believes in revelations over here. I like the way the show handles this seeking of surrogates because it feels very much like subconscious choices, which is more real life. Like you don't have Ellie going out there being like, I'm looking for a parental figure. You know, cause kids don't say that shit. Neither does Joel, but you can see that they are actually seeking that whether or not they admit it to themselves and i feel like they really capture the humanity of that very very well and realistic as well absolutely and also too i i mentioned it in this episode after we uh reacted to it i really did love that scene because uh, with maria and with ellie we didn't get that scene in the game and it just expands upon what was talked about in the game but we didn't get to see and just shows how defensive ellie can be of Joel and just again yeah. that that surrogacy that you just mentioned like you really feel like she is his daughter especially in moments like that where you, it just feels real like you really feel the gut punch of when Joel is gonna ditch her and she, how hurt she is by that like moments like that just add to that for me you never mentioned that Maria <laughs> <laughs> oh and Maria um is a good actress now, Joel ditching her in the next scene is a mirror of how Lucy felt in the film. In the end, Elliot takes the job and it seems like he's gonna be gone forever, but he asks Paula to restring the guitar that he left ah. in the apartment. Wow, this is very much The Last of Us. <laughs> right? And it ends on a more hopeful note, just like how Joel decides to take Ellie. Joel is also a keen guitar player too, and I love the similarities between this film and the arc in the episode. No joke, Last of Us was my first PS4 game, and when you have to play the guitar... I thought I could not beat this game because I did not understand whatever the center butter is. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. where you strum from. Yeah, yeah. And I spent funny. a solid 20 minutes how do going I do like, this? Uh, I, Call I, Andrew, what I, do I do? I had to go on Google and be like, how does this work? And then I couldn't find it. And then I called Olivia over <laughs> and she's like, I think you have to strum. Like immediately she got it. I'm like, oh my God, I'm hitting every button and the joystick and the pad. <laughs> yeah. I guess you learn a new thing every day because I never knew this story. Uh, <laughs> That, and I never knew that Last of Us Part Two was your first game on PS4. Mine was Destiny, which a fun game. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I like Last of Us Part Two a little bit more. But I probably would have given you a couple minutes of just let me see how long it takes Greg to figure this out. <laughs> That's awesome. I can just visualize this now. Now Ali knows his Tommy leaving, and we cut to Joel at a workbench trying to fix his shoe. Workbench. Workbenches in the game are where you do upgrades at, but here they set the scene for a difficult conversation between Joel and his brother. Tommy brings him some new boots and apologizes for going off before, which is when they launch into a really deep moment. This pulls somewhat from the game, and in that they kind of combine the boss scene with what we get here. She's immune. Immune to what? What? Really? She got infected, but she didn't get sick. Oh, seen come her, on. I know, I've seen her breathe enough spores to take down a dozen men, and nothing. Now, I wouldn't have believed it neither. But I can show you. I saw her get bit myself. That was months ago. Months. She's immune. All right. I'll bite. Why bring her here? From the beginning. I'm supposed to deliver to the fireflies. The way I figure they're your boys. <laughs> You finish the job, you collect the whole damn payment. I haven't seen a firefly in years. You know where they are. It was Marlene. She hired us to smuggle her to some fireflies. What makes you think I'd do this for you? You want me to take her? I'm just gonna get her killed, I know it. I'll take that girl of yours to the fireflies. You don't have to worry about it. I'll take her out at dawn. I love these scene by scenes. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> so Maybe some real good will come of this. I, I kind of like it more in the show because it's it's such a hard decision and takes such a toll on him for to hand over Ellie to Tommy to uh, deliver instead of him. Well, that they just also they established the it's PTSD, right? That he 
as would you say? I think he has like a uh, minor anxiety disorder. Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> anxiety, PTSD, whatever it's it is. But yeah, because they PTSD, yeah. yeah, because they established that and then the loss that he's incurred and he d- he just feels he's going to fail after what's happened with Tess, with Henry and Sam, with Sarah. He just doesn't want to go through that again. And even though it's a very hard decision because they've established that so much and obviously it was inferred in the game, like he, it's very similar. The way it's executed in the show, it's just like it, you can see in the way Pedro Pascal emotes it's just it's really well done executed and also too really quickly because i'm a little slow i didn't even pick up until we just saw the replay of that because they don't have spores in the in the tv show include the bite they had to get they had to include the second bite be so he could say that line because because he couldn't say what she's breathed in enough spores because that wouldn't have made sense in the show so obviously it makes sense that they had her get bitten a second time thinking the same thing yeah. yeah joel tells his brother the story of how they got there and he goes over brian in episode four He's realized he's too old for this shit, and it makes Joel reevaluate what kind of impact he's going to have on Ellie. She's had to shoot someone because of his actions, and he also froze when Henry had the gun pointed at him. He feels like she's better off with someone else, and the death of his daughter clearly still weighs over him. He says he's weak, that fear is causing his heart issues, and overall he's plagued with nightmares of what could go wrong. This is a side of Joel that we've never seen before, and watching Pedro cry brings a whole new layer to the character. Yeah. In the game, he was very sure and determined, whereas here, we see how broken he is. I think losing a child in the way he did would make you doubt yourself so much, and with another kid being entrusted to him, he just feels like he can't measure up. Tommy accepts the job, but as we learn, Ellie listened to this conversation, and she's heartbroken because of it. She's a fucking idiot though, isn't she? Ellie. Every, everyone hates her. What do you mean she's behind me? Now in the game, Tommy doing this caused Maria to kick off, and it was at this moment that Ellie grabbed a horse and left. If anything, anything at all happens to him, it's on you. Yeah, it's a lot more subtle, and Tommy returns to the screening, and Maria instantly knows what's going on. There's no words between them, and it's a really nice moment in which you can see her having to deal with the fact that her child's father's putting Great his life acting. on the line. Great acting. Yeah. Joe! What, what is it? That girl of yours. She took one of our horses and rode off. Damn it. Which way? Come on. I just saw her riding on out of here. Go back inside. Help the others clean the place up. Okay. Kill us! Now in the game when Ellie ran off, you had a bit where you followed her horse tracks until you found her holed up in a house. On the way you fought some raiders, just to vary the moments up because, you know, after all, you are playing a game. Now once you killed them and the raiders <laughs> yeah. in the house, you got a scene necessary. which Joel had a heart-to-heart in an upstairs bedroom, like what happens here. One of the best You just kind of combine the, the locations to make the bedroom Ellie's bedroom, and like I keep saying, Jackson was in the first game, so this house this house scene couldn't have happened. It couldn't have happened at the dam. It's one of the best scenes in the game. You don't know what loss is. Is this really all they had to worry about? Is this really all they had to worry about? Boys, <clears throat> movies, deciding which shirt goes with which skirt. Boys, movies, deciding which shirt goes with which skirt. It's bizarre. It's bizarre. Tommy knows this area. Oh, fuck than... that. Well, I'm sorry. I trust him better than I trust myself. Stop with the bullshit. I made this decision for your own good. You'll be way better off with Tommy. Oh. What? Maria told me about Sarah. Ellie? And... You are treading on some mighty thin ice here. I'm not her, you know. Maria told me about Sarah and... No. I'm sorry about your daughter, Joel. But I have lost people, too. I'm sorry about your daughter, Joel. But I have lost people, too. You have no idea what loss is. You have no idea what loss is. Everyone I have cared for has either died or left me. Everybody I have cared for has either died or left me. Everyone fucking except for you. Everybody fucking except for you. So don't tell me that I would be safer with someone else because the truth is I would just be more scared. So don't tell me that I'd be safer with somebody else because the truth is I would just be more scared. You're right. You're not my daughter. You're right. 
you know, my daughter. And I sure as hell ain't your dad. And I sure as hell ain't your dad. Yeah, you can't. You can't change the scene. <laughs> Going our separate ways. Get it together. We're not alone. Except for that part. It'll come down. <laughs> yeah. We're going our separate ways. And if I say no? Do you even realize what your life means? Listen, uh, Why are you here? I came here to talk to you. No, why are you still here? Well, I guess we're both disappointed with each other then. What do you want from me? Admit that you wanted to get rid of me the whole time. After this moment, we see Joel thinking back to Sarah. He remembers them decorating the tree at Christmas, and we get a long shot focused on a dove, and this symbolically means peace and love. John Woo. Hey, soft! These are things that Joel's lived without for quite some time, and he clearly has a change of heart as he's waiting at the stables for Ellie. Unlike the game, he gives her a choice of who to go with, but she immediately chooses him. I think this is why he ends up collapsing at the end, beyond the stab wound, because it's very much his worst fear coming true. He felt like he'd be a liability, and that he couldn't protect her. This is kind of proven it's right, because you're deaf. it does leave her in a very vulnerable position come the final scene. Now they say their goodbyes, which takes us into the university <sighs> section. This two pull from the game, and it was at this point that we learn more about Joel's past in which he wanted to be a singer. This too is reflected in the scene when they arrive. Well, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a singer. <laughs> Shut up. Why is that funny? What about you? What do you want to be? Right when I was a kid, I used to want to be uh, a singer. <laughs> Shut up. No serious. Sing something. Uh, no. Come on, I won't laugh. I don't think so. Joel, please. You gotta sing something now. No. Come on, man. I'm not gonna laugh. You're already laughing. <laughs> okay, Joel. I like the change of beat in that because in the game, Joel's like so apprehensive of telling her. It's like I wanted to be a. Singer, yeah, <laughs> there's a pause, and then uh, in the show, he's he just kind of like unveils it. Well, I, was, I wanted to be a singer, and then, and then, yeah, and then she laughs at him, which makes him close back up about <laughs> talking about it more. I think it's like a, a nice change of beat because, like, the same almost the same lines. I like the, the mix up of how they do it with emotionality, -wise. yeah. And was the camera angle a little bit different too? Where where it was when I mean, well, aren't you controlling the camera in the game in that moment? Usually you're from behind when it's uh, because you're controlling the horse, whereas here we can actually clearly see the actor's face. Either way, he's clearly starting to trust Ellie more, and we see them practicing with a makeshift shooting range. These moments are obviously because he doesn't know how reliable he's going to be, and thus he wants her ready for the dangers she could face. I think from this point onwards that there's a real change in Joel <laughs> well, and Ellie's reaction. relationship with them bonding a lot more. Everybody loves contractors. Anyway, they reach the University Everybody of loves Colorado, contract. and Ellie points out the mascot like what we get in the game. Oh, the big horns. What does that mean? Team mascot. That's a giant ram. You guys were like some idol worshippers. <laughs> when it came to sports, hell yeah. Uh, they also <laughs> come across some monkeys, like what we see in the episode. Are those monkeys? Must be from the old labs. Look at them go. I thought that was a Jumanji reference. Aww. Are those monkeys? Yeah, a whole mess of them. Now, the game had you realizing that the fireflies had abandoned the place because there was infected there. Gotta hate At clickers. one point, you had to drop <laughs> down into some of the dorms, which were teeming with clickers and a bloater. And a bloater. And stalk the hallways oh, looking for prey. It's such a good moment. I, I, lo think I love I love playing this of the level. Show is that they've skipped over a majority of these scenes, which really stand out in my memory. Yeah. The skyscraper, the hotel, and now this, which I think are the things I think of first when looking back to the game. Seeing how well they handle the clickers in episode 2, it made me really excited for moments like this, but unfortunately they again skip over them in the favour of other things. True. It's possible that they were infected here, as we do see sandbags piled high, blocking one of the doorways, and that could explain why they moved on, but there's no tense scenes like that. Either way, the outcome's the same, and we see some firefly symbols spray painted on a sign before they reach the biochemical labs. Inside this you found x-rays and scans yep. of the infected, and discovered that this was where they'd been trying to manufacture the vaccine. Having this would of course give the fireflies a lot of power, as they'd be able to distribute it to who they see fit, and thus they could very much decide who lives and who dies. Now firstly, Joel and Ellie enter a main hallway, and this looks similar to where Joel collapsed in the game. 
in that you were ambushed by bandits and he was impaled by some rebar after wrestling with one and falling off a balcony. Joel and Ellie find a list, and this is similar to the ones you'd come across in the game when visiting the area. I did actually want to know whether this university was the one they modelled the game after, as the environments are so similar down to the staircase in the rooms. They also bring across the moment in which you think the infected might be inside, and this is revealed to just be some monkeys. <laughs> The monkeys were very important to have around, as they're of course similar to humans on a genetic level, and it meant that the doctors and scientists Aww. could try out vaccines. Ali also theorized that monkeys spread the cordyceps back in episode 2, so maybe it's, or was it 3? It was episode 3, so maybe it's just coming full circle from that. Now here they find a map with the location St. Mary's on it. This shows where the fireflies have moved to, but it's interrupted by some raiders who arrive at the location. The attacker brings a baseball bat with him, which is a weapon you'd often use in the game. Joel strangles him and breaks his neck, which is also a move you could pull off when you grab people in this position. Nice little detail is that Ellie has her gun drawn here, and is ready to shoot the guy like how she did with Brian. I texted you about this yesterday, because I'm actually, I just played this level at the University of Eastern Colorado. It really bothered me in the video game when he fell onto the, the rod and got impaled. I mean, Ellie had about 20 seconds to help him when he was like struggling with the guy before he fell and didn't help him at all. And it just, it, I get it. They had to get him impaled, but it's just the way it was executed actually really bothered me. Oh, really? Did I don't it. remember it specifically. It's the first the, time. It's yeah. the first time I really noticed. I'm like, I counted actually. I'm like, I got to about 15 to 20 seconds. I'm like, why didn't Ellie jump on him, stab him? Like, I'm not saying she had to shoot him, just at least stab him. Some like, yeah. didn't help him at all. And that Ellie in the game by that point is already like, yeah, she's they, already been killing. Yeah, 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 they've been doing a lot of like, she's done a lot of killing at that point. Whereas <laughs> yeah. here, like, she was trying to shoot but didn't want to hit Joel, so it makes sense. And yeah. then he gets stabbed. Like this makes a lot more sense, is a lot more plausible, and does not bother me at all. So I pr still prefer in the game though having to sneak out. And yeah, fight no, the no, 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 no. It's, yeah, it's because there's a build up to him getting injured. I agree with you, but I prefer him getting stabbed versus falling onto that rod because I also when I every time I oh, play the game, I'm like, how did he survive yeah, he'd, that? He'd be way dead. <laughs> They went like halfway yeah. through his body. I mean, obviously, probably didn't get any major organs, but still, especially <laughs> with uh, yeah, <laughs> the loss of blood. Yeah. I mean, getting out of oh, there, the he lost he so much blood. Slamming his head. Oh yeah, there's no way he would have survived that. And she clearly has an angle where she can. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, he's pushed up against the rail. Yeah, Joel. exactly. Make it out, but Joel ends up falling off the horse, which ends the episode like how this chapter does in the game. Joel's worst fear has come true, and he's now left Ellie in a very vulnerable position. At this point, we hear an acoustic version of the song, Never Let Me Down Again. If you cast your mind back to episode 1, then you might remember that we heard the Depeche Mode version of the song playing over the radio at the end. It's spelled danger and it's very much By the way, there's a clicker right there. <laughs> I haven't the had that pointed out to me at all. With a friend that ended up letting them down, which is of course reflected in Joel here. Now his fate is left up in the air, and if you want to know what happens, and we'll be tackling it in our super spoiler section coming up what, next. Yeah, I'll mean. talk about that first before going into detail on the other spoilery easter egg, so you can check that out after if you want, or if you just want to know if he lives or dies, <laughs> then this is the bit for you. You still here? Don't Joel me, hey? Right, let's go. So Joel is still alive, but Ellie has to go out and hunt for food and medicine whilst he recovers. In the game, you don't learn his fate for at least an hour, and it was agonizing playing through it, not knowing what was going on. Now during this time she ended up hunting a bark and it managed to get away. However, she tracked it down, but this brought her into contact with David, who Cannibals. is from another settlement. Seemed like a nice guy, ah, guy ha, ha, ha. but he was a f***ing nightmare because he was a cannibal. Yikes. Now, they may be the ones <laughs> who were passed the river of death, yeah, he looks as scary they were the, the people part that one I version. immediately thought of. Oh, definitely. The couple said bodies were found in the river and that some of these were infected, whereas others weren't. The cannibals could have potentially been dumping them in the river and... They may have traveled down past Jackson, who just decided, yeah, we'll steal their reputation. Might be wrong on that, but yeah, that's just what I thought and when we're hearing that warning. Now, the constant mention of the sheep farm is a clear nod to part two, in that Ellie and Dina actually end up having we one, pointed and this that happens out. after they fail to kill Abby. Ellie gets constant PTSD flashbacks there of Joel's death, and this location being something that he wanted to do is clearly going to be something that will inspire the show's Ellie. Mm. Ellie also brings up Sally Ride around the campfire, 
And in case you don't know, she was the first American woman to travel into space. On part two, we get a flashback in which Joel takes Ellie to a museum for her birthday and they look about the NASA exhibit. Now, the Tipsy Bison is also a big part in the second game. After Ellie learns the truth about the fireflies, she decides to cut Joel out of her life, but the pair, of course, both still live in Jackson. They have a dance at the bar in which she kisses Dina for the first time. Dude. The bartender throws some homophobic slurs <clears throat> away. Big Joel it. steps in and punches them, and this is when Ellie starts to forgive him. Now, speaking of Dina, it is possible that we see her spying on Ellie when they're It's not possible. It is her. It's 100% her. And it's <laughs> a big love interest for the character in season two. Obviously, that's Dina. Do you think that that is going to be the actress that That's they keep for That's exactly the two? same thought. I was like, are they going to Cassie Lang this? That was exactly the same I, thought I was having. I'm really curious about that. <laughs> I mean, it's not the end of the world if they like cast someone else. I mean, but I'd be curious to know what the audition process was for because it's easy to it's easier to track down someone who looks like Dina. But did they give her actual lines to read so that way they can keep her for season two? Yeah, that that would be my curious. But yeah. that is exactly the thought I was having. Like, I wonder if they'll keep her. Yeah. <laughs> we also get the horoscope mentioning a secret admirer, which. Could indeed be her, because horoscopes are definitely real and always, uh, always. I didn't even spot. notice that. No. Now this leads us into the tour scene in which Tommy talks about using his rifle to headshot the infected. Rifle. Ellie asks if he can take her shooting, and at one point in part yeah. two, we go Tommy and shoot at the infected. That part is so using much fun. A sniper rifle. We also have the fact that the interrogation technique Joel uses at the start is something that she does in part two. The way this situation plays out in the game is far bloodier, oh, and no. Ellie takes the more gruesome approach as well later on. Beyond this, we have Maria talking about betrayal, and Joel somewhat does this with Ellie in the end. He lies to her about what happened with the fireflies, and she chooses to accept this lie because the truth's too unbearable to think about. There's also the giraffe picture in the room, which Giraffes. does foreshadow the big giraffe scene that happens just before they reach the fireflies. And really quick, too, the music that we got when Bill and Frank, in their, their final scene, when they were walking uh, after they had their meal and their wine with the, uh, all the, with the pills and stuff that they had, the music that we got from Gustavo Santalaya, that was the music that they had from that scene with the giraffe, so I just wanted to quickly point that out. They're located at St. Mary's Hospital, and we see this on the map that they discover at the university. Lastly, Tommy says there's a place for them, and the pair both, of course, end up in Jackson after the events of part one. Anyway, that concludes the episode. <gasps> he forgot it! You he forgot, forgot shit! It! You forgot- Okay, here it is. Good I forget the exact line. It's still gross. Yeah, that's what Ellie says. It's, it's still, still gross. It's still gross, and in the left behind, Riley offers to drink, and she's kind of being pressured into drinking, but uh, Ellie is- you have a choice to accept or reject the drink. If you accept it, Ellie does not like it whatsoever. And it's clearly a call, but saying it's still gross, it immediately made me flash to that moment in the left behind. Which Thank you me. then pointed to me and said, do you understand that reference? Which I had to keep a cool head like, yes, I did. Paul! Dude, this whole Failure. video, this whole video. 45 minutes waste of time is what I say. And also, too, I mentioned that I was going to talk about that picture with Sarah that Tommy showed in the video game that we've seen we didn't get here in the town of Jackson. It's pretty obvious to me, at least. And we talked about this off camera after the last, after this episode. I'm pretty sure that Ellie is going to bring up, like she did in the game, she's going to bring up the, she has that picture in her possession now on the show. And she's going to bring that up and show it to, and give it to Joel. She's going to be interesting because we didn't get that scene here. But again, if you've played the game, you got the gap filled there. It's going to be interesting for people who have never played the game and didn't get that scene. Uh, just like, where did you get that from? But you might have a line of dialogue from Ellie saying, Tommy gave it to me or I saw it. It was in Tommy's room or something, and I, I swiped it or something. Right. So I'm kind of curious to see what the explanation is, how she got it, because we know that in the game, I think it was uh, Tommy gave it to her, if my memory serves me correctly. But, yeah. You I'm know good. what would be better, though, what? is if when Ellie does give him the photo, she cuts out Sarah's head <laughs> and it's, takes a photo of herself and puts it over Sarah's body. And it's like, you have a new daughter <laughs> That would not be insensitive I, I in think any that way, would shape, be or form. So much stronger and more emotionally impactful. Yeah. And that's how you please audiences. Since we are on the spoiler, really quick, since we are on the spoiler talk, we got so much foreshadowing for part two, which I was so happy to get. I was just a little bit mystified that we didn't get like just a quick cameo too of Jesse. I thought maybe we were gonna get a little quick cameo. You know who'd be perfect to play him? Twenty years ago, Sung King. Han from <laughs> Fast and Furious. Ah. Wouldn't yeah. he have been great? He would have been good. He would yeah. have been perfect. Yeah. 
I could see that. I could see that. I could also see, uh, what's his name uh, from uh, Temple of Doom? Uh, I don't know. Steve is in everything ever wrong. Yeah. What's yeah. That? I don't know. I he, could, he could have played it, <laughs> yeah. too. All righty, guys. Well, heavy spoilers. Subscribe to Paul's channel. He's earned it. <laughs> Clearly. Look at this. Look at this. Despite that one miss. Despite that very. <laughs> Come on, Paul. <laughs> Hey, we at least, you know what? We got to educate Paul on one thing, so we should be proud of that. We're in the wrong business. We need to get into Easter eggs. Yeah, Easter and eggs and down. breakdowns, man. We can do it. All right, guys. Well, leave your thoughts down below. Subscribe. Leave a like. And, hey, let's end this with a... <laughs> Mikhail Linden. Mikhail, I just want you to know that if you ever got a cordyceps infection, I would 100% still let you room with me we'd have like a Shaun of the dead situation put you in the back house we get to play video games together you love the bond movies we would watch all the bond films together watch you evolve at sean connery stage from a runner to the, by the time we get to daniel craig you'd probably be a yep. clicker it would be an incredible experience and you know what mikhail i feel like it would make your life a lot more exciting if uh you went down this path don't worry. There's plenty of people I don't like that I could totally feed you. Because I, I want to get rid of this guy. Thinks he could pause the videos now. Shouldn't Stepping on it. my turf, my space bar turf, as Shouldn't I call it. it. Shouldn't have done it. I'm an evil, <laughs> evil man. Um, Mikhail, thanks for being part of Patreon. Patreon so long, dude. And uh, try not to get infected. And, Mikhail, I want to recommend a movie to you, 1997's Tom Arnold film known as Mikhail's Navy, directed by Brian Spicer, who directed the 1995 classic hit, Mighty Morphin's Power Rangers. Thanks.